Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. It's cold again, which is kind of comforting, I guess. So thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Kay Matchelot, the producing director at Max. And uh, we, uh, we're storytellers, creative technologists, performers, and scientists collaborate to make work that expands live performance with science and technology. So um, we are, tonight is our third of and final of our Max Forum series this fall. And this is where we bring our um, artists from our laboratory, Max Machina, together. And we bring them with collaborators and scientists and like-minded creatives to think about some of the more challenging questions that come up in the work. So uh, tonight, um, I'm thrilled that we have um, these three people coming together. It's really oh, uh, wonderful for me that these three particular people are here tonight. And um, first, I will s talk about Modesto Flaco Jimenez. He is um, a Dominican-born, Bushwick-based, multi-hyphenate ar artist. He is a poet, a playwright, an educator, an actor, a producer, and director. He's definitely a polymath. His art addresses um, the political changes and social changes affecting the Latin American community in Bushwick. His art making really shifts thinking. And um, his um, play, Taxilandia, which took you on a ride through um, Bushwick, brought the past, present, and future of Bushwick alive in, a, in the most extraordinary way. And it has now been um, opened in San Diego, so it's expanding minds in San Diego right now. And it's, it's going to be in other American cities, so stay tuned for that. Um, it's a wonderful experience. If you get it in any city, it will be extraordinary. He is the founder of um, uh, and the artistic director of Oye Group. We are very grateful to have him as a Max Machina artist this year, where he's, he ex he's expanding his piece Mercedes, and with um, through science and technology to be able to reach more and deeper into his community. And talking with him will be Dr. Nikki Clayton who is on our Board of Advisors, and she's a Professor of Comparative Cognition in the Department of Psychology at the University of Cambridge. She's a Fellow at the Royal Society. They have those kinds of things in England. And her, her expertise lies in the contemporary study of comparative cognition. Um, we are lucky to have her in New York briefly. She will turn to the UK and Europe to receive two prizes next week, one the Tinbergen Prize and the other the Association of Animal Behavior Medal. She says she's never had a medal before, so she'll be able to wear it on her dress or something. Um, Nikki's also the first scientist in residence at Rambert, formerly the Rambert Dance Company, uh, a position she's held for 11 years. She collaborates with Mark Baldwin, the founder, on new choreographic works inspired by science, including the Laurence Olivier winning the comedy of change. She and Flacco have been riffing, riffing together on Zoom, and I've been uh, lucky enough to be part of those conversations. And I um, about it's about memory. Well, you'll see. It's you'll you'll find out. Uh, I believe me, they won't stop talking. Anyway, um, and and to help uh, guide this conversation is Adora Udo, an, another board of advisor from um, a member of our board of advisors. And she's an award-winning storyteller and producer. Currently, she is vice president of programming and operations at PBS. The genres go across the board, news, current affairs, film series, web series, and podcasts. And Adora also works across platforms of radio, movies, video, podcast, virtual, and augmented reality. So, and she has contents that premiered at Sundance, Tribeca, and on Google. So she, has, she was a broadcast journalist, correspondent and anchor, winning many awards, including the Alfred I. DuPont Award for her reporting uh, in, uh, about Hurricane Katrina. So um, she's also a teacher at ITP and at NYU, a, a place we often work with people from there and about there, so thank you. Um, and so I want to thank tonight, it's our third and last, so I want to thank our partners, New Inc., um, Onyx Studio, the Onassis Foundation, uh, particularly um, Sensorium, John and Matthew, who have the fantastic <laughs> production support, <laughs> and Vallejo Gartner from Gettner from 
um, Onassis Onyx, who keeps this place lit and bright and, and really interesting. And thanks for having us. And uh, two, f and oh, finally, thanks to our Max board and our donors, specifically tonight to Diane Max, who's made the meeting of these minds possible. And uh, one announcement, there will be a reception afterwards, join us for wine and a bite. And um, also our applications open to our Max Machina Laboratory. Actually, I think they just went live on our website. So check that out if you're interested. So thanks for coming. And um, I hope I see you in the spring at some of our workshops. And they'll come up. Hello. I wish we could sort of form a talking circle um, and I could see you guys. This, these bright lights are bright. Um, hi, I'm Adora. This is Flaco and this is Dr. Nikki. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. And Kay was not wrong. Um, I think the two of them should have their own show and I think you'll see that. But, but even more than that, it doesn't happen very often, and I think there's a few people in here who could attest to this, but I've been thinking so much about the conversations I've had with them, about what I watched on Zoom, that I really don't have a plan tonight. So, because there's so much to cover, and, and their minds are so big and bright and creative, um, and the way they look at the world and the work that they're doing is really profoundly inspiring. So um, that sounds like a lot, but it's probably not even scratching the surface after you listen to both of them. So I just want to thank you before we start, because I think you've sort of changed my life in uh, some ways um, in, 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 in listening to the conversation. So today we're talking about that nexus of science and art, right? And if we think about it, the imagination has always propelled the evolution of humankind. Things can't be different until you can imagine maybe there is something different. And I think that's the nexus of where the two of you live. And I think there are a couple of words, um, a couple of descriptions that you each shared that have really stuck with me. Um, and so I'd like to talk about you as human beings a little bit first, and then let's talk about storytelling and how you each approach it. And then let's talk about three dimensions and inner dimensions of how we tell stories and we integrate all of those, all of that thinking. But Dr. Nikki, um, from wanting to be a bird to becoming a dancer to scientist, talk to us about that. Um, well, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a bird think like a bird and move like a bird. So I've always wanted to fly, and I don't mean on an aeroplane, they're handy tools, but I meant to literally get across the room. And it was my love of movement that led me to do ballet like many young children do, and then later to get into contemporary dance and jazz. And then now I also um, perform and teach Cuban salsa and Argentine tango. And I suppose it was my love of birds that also got me into science because I didn't just want to know about how they move, which is the choreographic dance a bit, but I also wanted to know about how they think. And I realised that to do that, I would need to do some science, and particularly to focus on zoology, or more specifically ornithology, and also psychology so that I had the right kind of thinking tools to be able to find ways to ask them about what they can remember, whether they can imagine the future and importantly plan for it, and whether they can think not only about other times, but also other minds. Flaco, you talked about how there's been an evolution in your practice from wanting to perform to wanting to 
engage with community. Can you talk about that? Um, can you hear me? I just think like after the pandemic, I had a reality check. Like during the pandemic, um, I created a piece called Taxilandia that Kay was talking about that was originally created to be in a car. And I was trying to sell it for like five years, pitch it, workshops, everything, trying to do everything and self-invest and all of that. And like nobody wanted it. It was like, no, create the stage show. And then I created a small version of like, look, no, this is what it would look like in the car. But I put it up on stage and then people started gravitating to that. And then I ended up creating this stage version because that's what people wanted. So like a big investment to a stage situation that then the pandemic happened. And then everybody wanted the car show. <laughs> And I was like, this is what I said all along. And then I started like backtracking about all the other plays and all the other things and being like, oh, shit. It's always what I've thought about. And it's always back to the block. And it's always like, how do I bring you take you out, out of the stage? Because I keep filming my neighborhood and bringing it to you. Or filming this beautiful woman speaking to me and then bringing it to you. And like, let's, let me just take it to the block. And let me first, if I need to do a stage play, before you get the stage play, how can we go to the block first? And not just that one. But when you say go to the block, what does that mean? So like, you know, like, um, have you go and actually engage in the community that the production is about? So like right now, Mercedes is about dementia, mental illness, my grandmother, personal, but also I know that that would be at the end so how do I make sure that I activate to put on some tools and support that I was able to use while I was going through caregiving for her for like the five years that I did that to keep my art alive? So how do I pass those tools down to people before I even give people my stage play? So how do I activate and go to the community? And like, yo, seniors, y'all ain't got the mentor yet. So here's coloring books and here's this and here's that and here's that that activates your minds to do this, do this, do that, keep it flowing. Cause you're just at home and it's, you need to keep it moving. And like, how do I tell that to the caregiver and to, right? And all that creating workshops, but first creating a story that people could come in and digest, not traumatize them by it. And like creating those different, this is why I'm here. Cause I don't know how to create PR, but I'm trying to figure out the new way of like the person that can't leave home anymore. Because they have to stay. Well, there. let's get back to the oh, story sorry. because I want to. No, I want to talk to to both of you about what story has meant. Um, so, is it cathartic for you then? This idea of taking a lived experience and extending it, or mirroring it back. I'm just realizing that we all go through this shit, and like we just don't talk about it. So, how do I? But you're turning it into art in the same way that you're talking about motion and dance, right? This idea of wanting to understand beyond the mechanics of the bird flying, right? Mm -hmm. But what the bird is thinking, what that community is like, what that relationship is between mm -hmm. the bird and the wind and all of the other mm -hmm. elements, right? I mean, there's a contextual element. Yeah, and of course I do also work with human beings, particularly children and adult humans. And also with cephalopods, which are the cuttlefish, octopus, and squid. And the I suppose the bit for me that is that really interesting nexus is is really two things. One is how you marry thinking with and without words. So obviously the cuttlefish and the crows are thinking without words. You know we can argue about. Are that. they actually thinking? Do well, we know that? Yes, we do. And mental time travel. You gotta see the video. Yeah, mental time travel, the ability to remember the past and imagine the future is probably the strongest scientific evidence for thinking. Okay, the you know you have to stop there and tell us a little bit about that. Yes. What is mental time travel? So mental time travel is the ability to be able to travel back in the mind's eye to think about the past and travel forwards in the mind's eye to imagine the future. And when I first started this work, scientists assumed that humans were the only animals that could do that. And in fact, long before psychologists were thinking about mental time travel, 
artists such as the poet Robbie Burns wrote a beautiful lament, Ode to a Mouse, in which he describes how he feels so guilty because it's dusk and he's ploughed up a mouse's field and watches the mouse run away and realises that because he's destroyed his nest, that mouse will surely, surely die. And then he turns to the mouse and in the lament he says, Still thou art blessed compared with me. The present only touches thee, but oh, I cast my eye on prospects drear and forwards, though I cannot see and fear. So for Robbie Burns, he'd already made that connection that somehow remembering the past and imagining the future are all part of this, the same process, rather than thinking of memory as just being a repository of facts about the world. And he assumed that mice can't do that. Now, obviously... Robbie Burns is sadly long gone, so I can hardly have a conversation with him now about you know, whether he thought the same applied of crows. But the work that we've done has now firmly established that these animals can do this. And I had two scientists who were, who were very adamant that animals, other than human beings, because we are animals after all, we're not plants, we're animals, or fungi for that matter. Um, <laughs> but... They argued at the very beginning. Oh my God! Respect that gangster shit she just dropped. Y'all was getting quiet like she didn't just drop bars, bro. Oh Lord! But I got them to switch sides. One has now popped his gloves and is no more. But he switched sides before um, he passed away, and the other one um, joined our club of merry men and ladies about two years ago. Now we even wrote a paper together showing that the animals are capable of this. So I think that's a very strong example of thinking. And so, Flacco, when you hear her talk about that, I mean, what are you reacting to and what are you relating to around this idea of memory and time and space? The moment when somebody that has, like, dementia is in a wheelchair, but then all of a sudden they get up, they go do the dishes, and you have to go and like stand by them because you're scared because you think they're going to like stop and then all of a sudden you do have to grab them because they forget. Right? So it's that moment that you're like, wait, but you couldn't, you, you couldn't walk two seconds ago and all of a sudden now you're walking but your brain, your body told you you can walk right now and then your brain shut off again and let it be known that you can't move these limbs no more. So like those are things that I just saw. So I saw that happen. Oh, go on now. So I saw that happen like in, in real time. And then I've heard other caregivers from the block, right? Like the other brothers that are doing it for their mothers and shit. Like, yeah, yeah, did, did yours get up and cook, bro? Mine's was in bed for like a week and then all of a sudden she got up and cooked. I'm like, yeah, nah, mine's did the wheelchair one. And like that's how I'm like, oh shit, so it's hot. It, the memory is, it's, the, ah, go on you. The memory, the memory is there, there's a switch that just happens, turns off, and tells the rest of the body, like, nah, we ain't fucking with each other for now. Um, but then the body is still doing what it wants to do because it's already done it before. So it's like, oh, wait, when I did this, but then once it stopped, that's most, it's all these things that I'm seeing that I just, what? No, no, keep, no, oh, keep, like, no, keep going. No, I just want her to, her to, to jump in. Right. At, at, but no, no, but just, no, just keep but going. So this was, was what, what you witnessed. To me was what, like, I was hearing from the community when I was engaging them, asking them, like, I know your mom's ain't coming outside no more, so she going through this shit too? Da -da -da -da. Mm -hmm. So what are you going through in at home? And like, oh, shit, yeah, bro, she's doing this and this. I'm like, yo, you making sure you got Medicaid for yourself too, nigga? Like, so yeah. doing sharing tools that way, because I'm able to, like, talk to ya. So I think there's an it interesting distinction between body memory or corporal memory if you like, and what I'd call mental memory or cerebral memory, right? So the cerebral memories would be your experiences. So maybe later on tonight you, you think about what we've been talking about and you recall your experience of listening it, to it. Whereas the body memories or the corporal memories are the, the skills that you've acquired that your body can do. So as a dancer, pirouetting and spotting and chenet turns would be examples or it could be something as simple as learning to drive a car once you've learned how to drive you don't think about how you need to shift gears or use the brake pedal or whatever so we've explored quite a lot of that and the thing about body memories is that the 
by definition, the body has unconscious access to those memories. Whereas the problem with the corporal memories, the experiential memories, is you have to have conscious access. So people often talk about things like dementia and Alzheimer's disease as memory loss. But the memories aren't lost. They haven't gone anywhere. You know, there isn't a leaky hole at the bottom that they've seeped out of. <laughs> it's that your memories are there, but in the absence of having conscious access to them, you can't get to them. And so Flacco and I explored, for example, the idea of doors and how you might have a door that opens, but most of the time it's locked. And if the door is locked... and for five minutes, it opens up, and you remind yourself that, oh, shit, I left that dish that I from three days ago. And then you get up, and you're like, and then you don't see that dish, and then it locks. Yeah. So that moment to me is like, oh, shit, so it's not gone. Having yeah. that conversation and being like, oh, so I thought, I knew something was disconnecting, but I thought it was just gone fully. And like now understanding, having those conversations, being like, oh, there's a switch here. Isn't that like bizarre? Like, because we we do in mainstream conversation. I'm not a medical professional, um, but this idea of an absence, right, as opposed to an absence of access. Like, I've never heard that description of how someone can be in bed for a week and then get up and clean the house. Yeah, and you know, just thinking about how. Memory is such an integral part of our lives for most healthy individuals. You know, it's easy to think of it as, oh, well, memory is about the past. So, you know, if you have these problems, it's just the past that's gone. But it's not just the past because the present has to be contextualized if it's to be believed. How do I know if I'm hungry or not? Well, if I have nothing to compare with when I felt full and when I felt hungry, how do I know? Especially if I can't even remember whether I had a meal recently. So those sorts of things, I think, are really interesting, that, th that memory pervades the whole of the body and the mind. I, you can think of it, we've been using the door analogy, you can think of it as the door to identity, because memories shape who we are, and who we shape who we are shapes what we choose to remember. Each and every one of us after tonight will have a slightly different memory of what we thought we experienced. And there's one little saying I'd just like to share with you all. You don't remember what happened. What you remember becomes what happened. So none of us have a highly accurate record of what is actually happening. It's subjective because our experience is subjective. But somehow we take ownership for what we've chosen to remember and assume that that, make, that is what actually happened. And we just do that 24-7. It's what we naturally do. But of course, Flacco's wonderful grandmother yes. and anyone else with dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Can't do that anymore. And of course, if you've got Parkinson's disease, you can't even have those memory movements in the same way because it fundamentally affects your ability to move. So let's talk about your mother and the houses. Let's just talk about houses a little bit more yeah. and about what that memory journey yeah. was like? So uh, there was a moment that I realized that she had, it wasn't the same person and something was off. Like there was like, th I know this is my mother, but she's forgetting the seasoning that she always uses and she makes intentionally a season that's green and this weird ass jar that we feel like is there forever for years, but that's the season she uses. And now the seasoning is not happening. Oh, that's weird to me, but I'm not going to stress it. Um, wait, you're going to the Dominican Republic? Cool. She's going back to the motherland to like sign papers on a house that we got. And she was actually in the same house for 10 years in America, where all she did was go to her appointments and come back home. And go to her appointments and come back home. 
So the dementia never sped up because it was in this bubble. And then what happened by going to the Dominican Republic, it was a different world. So then her mind couldn't like fathom that new world and it took her back to just those memories of that world and bringing back people to life from those moments when she was in that world. And the only way she came back would be through conversations of people here on this side, on their phone, until she, we could bring her back to America to the constant that the mind remind, like, was more focused on. Because the mind in DR already was just the kid mind. So it was this weird moment that that's when we knew, oh shit, the actual, and then this is when you look through all the paperwork and you go to the doctor and the doctor's like, no, she actually had this since 2001. So she held it and kept it to herself for all those years. And then in 2017, when there was a different world around her that she couldn't control, and then come back, comes back in a wheelchair and that's when I'm like, grandma, what are you saying in that? And she's looking at me and I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta go to the doctor with you on Monday because this is not you. And that was the moment of me understanding how like, oh shit, you, the house you bought to give you a new world and get away from the 10 year world that you were just like stuck in, you felt, and that actually was actually keeping your mind more locked in. Intact. Until the split. And so let's talk about the exploration and art, like the nexus here of understanding you're witnessing, and what I'm hearing is witnessing, and then I'm hearing a scientist talk about some of the elements of what's happening physically. So let's marry those two with how then you evolve it into an artistic expression. I, the, the, I guess the healing moment for me about, again, trying to go back to tools and stay in like, this was an ill learning experience for me because all I lived is in art. And like gang member that dealt with Shakespeare the whole time in his life and like was privileged enough to go to like privileged colleges and shit to just have fun as an artist because my grandmother facilitated that for me, right? So then it was this moment of me seeing like, oh shit, I learned so much in all this art shit that I was able to share with you in the house and play out characters that you would be like, Jose, and I know Jose been there for fucking 20 years, but I'm gonna play out Jose for those five minutes for you. Cause I know Jose used to throw like this, mommy. Jose, Doña Callese, and play out Jose for her. And it would be like, oh, for those 30 minutes that she will come back, I'll get to be me. But when she's other people, I could get to play those characters and use my skills that art taught me, that she facilitated for me to have, right? And then the, mo the next step for me was like, now how do I give this to people before I even give people my art? How do I give them the tools that is affordable from a 99 cent store? You could go get a coloring book and a pack of crayons, sit with your, sit with your, with your moms, and just be like, yo, let's color some shit. Yo, tell me a story about the all. And like start building so it's not something that you have to unearth after, right? So I'm trying to create that tool that stop being reactive and more proactive so when the shit does happen, you already have a toolkit. So more of that and figuring that out through the arts. Like, exhibition, look at her story so you don't feel like you're in a weird wake or some weird shit like that. Like, look at her art. Like, she literally collected art. Look at the story of this woman that literally took care of so many people in the journey of America, because we're all migrants. Look at the migrant story, and for a moment it would have been forgotten. You are all carrying it with you now, it's not forgotten. So, but Dr. Nikki, let's talk about the grounding Right, like he's describing two things. One, what is happening to someone mm -hmm. he loves and then what the caretaker can do about it or the people who are surrounding them. I mean, what's the rea reality of that from a, a scientific perspective? I mean, c can you create that connection in that way that we're talking yeah, about? I think you can and I've got a new project that's starting soon with one of my PhD students who actually came from a theatre background and then did a master's in psychology at King's College London. Um, and we're looking at this whole idea that memories move. And look, for example, I mean, in the case of Flacco's grandmother, it, it's not, the emphasis isn't, is not on trauma, but there are many people that suffer post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, and you can help them enormously 
with those stress-induced memories by capitalising on the fact that memories move and that you can therefore change the perspective of the memory of what they thought happened. Um, and we're very interested in looking at the sort of architectural structure of storytelling and how it fits in with this whole idea of memory and imagining the future. Because stories are all about mental time travel, whether they're fiction stories where it might be contemporary dance con conceptualising an idea that the brain has difficulty thinking about. For example, Mark Baldwin and I choreographed a piece called Strange Charm of Mother Nature, which was, you know, all about particle physics. And another one, Comedy of Change, that was all about the biology of evolution and the contributions of Charles Darwin. Um, so, you know, I think art very often is an excellent way of conceptualising and providing emotional layers and experiences. You know, I can describe a patient and say, well, Oliver Sacks discusses in his book the case of Jimmy G, the lost mariner, and how he looked in the mirror, and it, he was 59, but in his mind he thought he was 19 and is completely shocked when he sees the image of his face in the mirror, and then luckily he forgets it again soon thereafter and everything is back to normal. But what art gives you is these rich layers of emotional experiences um, and flavours and tastes and smells that bring these things to life and really show how these things profoundly change the way a person sees, the way a person feels, the way a person remembers, the way a person thinks. And so that's why I think that intersection between the two is so powerful. So to go off that, we have this deep fake um, that we created, like an old picture of my father at 15 years old. And we have letters from him that he wrote. So we actually created a memory like that. Like, hey, look at this picture of the old. And there are people coming to the gallery being like, oh, shit, I have that. I can create this memory of like my father asking for things and like la like laugh for him. We're like, you remember when we were there in that time period? And like it was, I'm like, yeah, it's happened. Cause now it's no longer dark. I'm making some joy with some with a picture and letters that you find and all this archival stuff and go home and create your own gallery now with your family. Cause you have all the same shit. I had it in my grandmother's house. So that little moment is like where I'm geeking out at where I'm like, I'm just gonna go and tell my aunt, yo, you remember this letter you read when you were 17? Uh, read it again, now at 30. I'm gonna put it to that picture you sent mama. And I'm gonna have people being able to see that moment of like what it was in 1983 when you were struggling, but you're not no more. So through that moment, I'm showing these people they can also do the same thing and build off that. And everybody loves QR code, so here's a QR code or something, scan. For, <laughs> forgive me, but we do have a video, right? Yes, so video before time. we go to the video, can you tell us why did you think about virtual reality or 3D storytelling as opposed to 2D or flatties as some may refer to them, or pictures or an exhibit or I like failing et cetera, forward. et cetera. Um, I like failing forward and first I started with what I know, which is like, let me create something where people could come in and experience and then that was a big massive money fail. Because it was like you created some shit where you didn't even find out if the people could make it because they're actually home taking care of people and this and that. And then after doing that type of research, it was like, oh, you could get them if you're going to do field trips from a senior center to the workshops live. And then bus them back and feed them and do all that type of care. But then what happened to the person that's literally emailing you saying, I want to go, but I can't. That was, a, that was actually what happened during our first trial in Bushwick. So we're like, okay, send them the video, send them this, send them that. But we need to create some. We need, like, how do we feed them? Because they need something because they can't the even caretakers. leave. Yeah, the caretaker can't leave. They have to be there 24-7. And probably during that moment of sleep, they can go outside and get the milk and the juice. So 
during that moment that they can actually have a moment for themselves to like enjoy something or create something. How can we give them a story? Like, look, you're not the only one. Look at this beautiful story that also gives you these tools for you to play at home. So it's for me, it's, I don't know how to make VR, but I know these people do. So I we know, know, I know how to write stories. <laughs> so we're gonna fail forward and see if we can create something for caregivers. Okay, Ryan, can we check out that video? This is a glimpse of what the healing room looks like in VR. You are opening the door now. He is opening the door now. She is opening the door now. We are opening the door now. They are opening the door now. Closed. I'm closing the door now. You are closing the door now. He is closing the door now. She's closing the door now. We are closing the door now. They are closing the door now. I am reading the newspaper, writing the verbs, spelling English words, studying English. So tell us a little bit more about what we just witnessed. I'm also trying to respect that she left everything behind. She left her story, so I should let her, her words tell it. Um, and that's an example of that. Like that's her own writing, trying to learn the verbs in English. So how do I let her tell her own story? Because you also go through the, oh, so you think I'm helping her with the door, or you think she's still trying to make the door open, or struggling. So just layering her own words to tell the story of dementia. Um, when she was learning a whole new language and probably forgetting another one. So this moment of just letting the story be told by the facts and me just having fun learning my grandmother's life because as a migrant, you usually keep things away from your people because you don't want them to be hurt while you're struggling and the resilience and all this extra. So for me, it's like, Let's do the project that can activate not having to even be resilient. Like, you can be normal. If they pass those tools down, we don't need to be resilient because they gave us the tools to begin normalcy. So for me, it's like, if I'm able to create a project that can go into spaces of a gallery where people could go in a community where it's Henry Street Settlement, 100 years in the community providing already health, so that's a building that can get a gallery because people already engage it and do that type of, so engage the art spaces for what they do to address the problem in that zone. So it's, I'm just trying to have fun with a new medium, really, and like celebrate the story that is not gonna be forgotten. And Nikki, when you watch something like that, what goes through your mind? Well, it's very poetic, for sure. Um, no, it is, is. yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think the thing is the imagery is very simple. And that is meant to be a massive compliment, not an insult. Oh, okay. It's the simple but not naive, right? When you just cut to the chase and find a really powerful analogy like the doors and then the words and the idea of perhaps forgetting one language that's was so much about words to learning a new language, which is how to try to compensate as best as you can for this loss of movement in both the mind, because memories move, as well as bodies. So it's, it's you know, using those analogies and those powerful metaphors in a simple and very elegant way to trigger 
the audience's reaction to these debilitating diseases and try to see it in more of a positive light than rather than just going, oh, isn't this terrible, yeah, right? I'm trying to, uh, a thing that I always tell, uh, shout out to the team, shout out to the squad, Cricket, Kevin, Stephanie, OJ Group Squad. Um, it's, we're not trying to break people, we're trying to crack. That's it. I'm not trying to break anybody because then you won't be able to engage me. So I'm trying to crack from the norm that you usually have. Because if you're dealing with some shit that I created, I'm always trying to create some shit that I have not seen. So I right, come and play, let's play, and I'm gonna try to crack you. So then we can engage in, in, into an uncomfortable section or talk about something and see if we can come up with an understanding to something. Not trying to find the answers. If we don't, we don't. But if I crack you, I think we can have a conversation because then we're both in an uneven zone. So let's back up a little bit, because I'm just curious uh, about what, what was the inspiration for each of you for the work that you're doing now? I think we talked about this briefly before, which is to say um, we often think about evolutions as a linear line right, of, of, and around even creativity, but particularly in science, right, that it's a very deductive straight line. But talk to us about what, what ignited, what lit the fire for you to move in the direction that each of you have taken. Well, I think one of the things that's so special about mental time travel is that it isn't a straight line. If you think about the stories we tell ourselves, of what has happened to us over the years. It's I meant it more personally to you as a human being. Yeah, I'm coming on to that. Okay, good. Um, the she got you. It's, <laughs> it's subjective, but shit. you can go back to <laughs> a time in early life as quickly as you can go back to a time that happened a few moments ago. And the whole idea for me is that mental time travel is more like a figure of eight kind of shape than a line because the past, the present and the future all become one. What is now the future will soon become the present and then the past. But with all this flip-flopping, when you think about the past, you often use it to think about the future, which is why Lewis Carroll was so correct in saying it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards because our memories evolve for the future. And I think I found that subjectively in me a very powerful message that would then inspire my science and my art, my science in terms of thinking about what kinds of tests I could do on the crows and jays to show aspects of remembering the past and imagining the future, and also how it um, inspired the choreography that I was doing on contemporary dance with Mark Baldwin on how we could convey through movement these wordless thoughts. But when you were 10 years old, you didn't know anything about any of these things. I didn't know anything about mental time travel then. Right, exactly. So, I mean, but what was the... I mean, what was the first step? I mean, the I heard stories about you and miniskirts and dancing. Oh, the mini yeah, the oh, miniskirts mini stories. stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a dancer. If, you, so if you've got it, everybody flaunt go, it. Everybody go see The Guardian, Nikki Clayton and The Guardian. Google that. You're going to see Legs, Tango, and Birds. You heard? <laughs> bird song. But no, it was birds. I wanted to be a bird. I wanted to move like a bird and think like a bird and realized that actually, so when I applied to university, um, I applied to the University of Oxford and I wanted to do a joint degree in psychology and biology. And Oxford doesn't do that. So I had the choice that either I could read zoology or psychology with philosophy. And I was very intrigued by both um, and wasn't sure which one to do. And that interview, um, one of the men interviewing me, um, who then became my mentor and very close friend, Lord John Krebs of Whiteham, 
said, well, if you choose... She just name drop, niggas. Respect that. <laughs> just take it in. She said, Lord, nigga, respect it. He's, yeah, he's, he's pretty dumb. He's the name drop, right? He's pretty dumb cool. Um, but he, he said I'm to me... I'm just saying, I know y'all ain't get it. Y'all was like quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you, ha you haven't even got me talking about Sir David Attenborough yet, yes. now, have you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but John said to me, well, if you choose zoology, you can do a bird behaviour research project. And so I was like, right, I'm doing zoology then. He says, sign me up. Moment. All right, but, you know, Flacco, what, how, tell us a little bit about... I heard Gangster, uh, heard Bennington, which don't seem to really go together very well. Yo, Bennington was dope, bro. They let me do whatever the fuck I wanted. So it's like that, right? It was like, I want to go and study theater and DJ at night, because that's what I used to do in Bushwick. So th I'm going to just tell them what I... Uh, they knew me too from adapting Shakespeare, because as a kid, I'm like, Shakespeare do man novelas. My people know, love novelas. Let's go. One and one. But um, with me, it was like always embracing the unknown, right? So it's like I'm creating a play that deal, deals with the brain. So there's a moment there that I got to go into an unknown that is all the science of all that shit. So I'm going to have some fun with all of that. Like right now, I'm geeking out about that there's one bird from the Dominican Republic that as soon as it leaves the Dominican Republic, it dies. But there's also 17 other birds that actually migrate to other places. And today I found out that birds shed their leaves. I didn't know that shit. That's like snakes. So I'm just, <laughs> so I'm literally geeking out right now with all the new science. And that, that I, has to do with this insulation that you work yeah, in, right? Right. Yeah. So the, um, at First Abrams 80s. Art Center right now, uh, if anybody has time, you can go to Abrams Art Center. It's open till 9 p.m. There is a gallery installation about Mercedes by her word. So the story of Mercedes by her. So you can go and take that journey and then there's a other room that has a lot of art arts and craft materials with prompts that you can do to let something out right so you don't got to carry that story with you after you leave you can start documenting your story and your people's stories so that is at abrams art center and we're trying to figure out how do we put that in a vr right so that's what you saw the glimpse the beginning glimpse of and then when we finish that you get what people are used to a fourth wall and a plate you know the work. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just being real. I've done that shit. So I got to challenge myself and be in an unknown that is a room full of people that know how to talk about. I learned about that there's mocap. You know what I'm saying? It took me three months to figure okay, that shit out. Okay, but now you got to tell people what it is because some people might not know. Nah, I'm not the... You explain. That's you. for motion capture. The end, that's you. I know, but you're learning what that is. So tell them what you've learned. Shout out to Kerr with an intern Kerr showing me that G shit that I ain't be knowing. <laughs> got to shout her out. See the one out here passing them tools down already as an intern. Love interns. Um, just got to shout out. You know how it be. Yeah, no, it's good. But, but what is motion capture? Um, Tell them. I'm just trying to make sure that I could do some crazy shit and like do a dance with a poem and figure out how that motion capture then looks on camera. And then me make a choice if it's I want to keep it. Right? Three, I it's, say, yo, it's, they're going to do that. Right. That's the part that I'm like, I just want to have fun. I know that this is going to do something. And then I'm going to watch what that did. But I still did, did what I... Failing forward, figuring out a dance with a wheelchair, a cane, and a walker in this space, and figuring out what that these cameras do after in 3D, and I just want to see what that is, and if that can be a dance that then I can go write a song to, that then can be in the play. But it's in the VR, it's a beautiful piece, right? So it's the layering for me that is like that geeking out moment where like, can I actually make this happen where all through I'm being able to complement all the other layers that are the Mercedes project. And can I get a cool team of dope ass collaborators to as, like help me in that? Cause I don't know what fully motion capture. See how I'm trying to like go back. Like, I don't really know what that shit is. They just told me this is what it is. So what are you learning from each other? A lot about birds, a lot about migration, a lot about just cool people, right? Like a lot about like, I'm, I think I'm gonna go next year to London for a month and like, and like go and geek out and like, f and bring a wheelchair, a cane and all these things and be like, Nikki, you ready to talk about birds and dancing? I'm gonna be here for a month. I'm, here's some chicken, let's play. <laughs> right? I ain't, Cause I ain't got pheasant money in London. Let's keep it a hundred. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're gonna have chicken and, and, there. And Nikki, what would you say? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's all about the exchange of ideas, but for those, exchanges to be effective 
You've got to have a chemistry. You've got to connect. And we connect. And we connect. That's the home, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the I'll home be teaching right? him tango next. Listen, listen. <laughs> Maybe we'll do a bit of bachata later. Let's <laughs> That's the Dominican music, just so y'all know. She just dropped bars. <laughs> bars. She ain't say some other, she, she said tango, because that's what she fuck with, and then she was like, I'm gonna give him his, bachata. Yeah. Yeah, and we I need a podcast. Both. We need a podcast. <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> it's about listening carefully to one another and playing with one another. You know, the, the discussions we're having, as you can see here tonight, are very playful. I mean, there's a serious element to them, of course, but that playfulness and that connectivity or chemistry and the ability to use language in such a way that we can both connect with it, bringing our different perspectives. So would you say that art expands science or does science constrain art? I teach it. Or what is that interplay and how would you describe what it is at this period in both of your well it, it can practices. do both so if it's done badly then science constrains art in an annoying way that isn't helpful to either the scientist or the artist but if it's done well then it expands it by allowing you to see the same idea from multiple different perspectives right so, so for example Right, my grandmother, um, really Catholic heavy, and I know that I could go with the cop out and use a dove and shit. Like, but now I'm like fucking with the right scientist. That's like, I'm gonna send you some bird shit, right? And that already activated me because I like that type of swag. That I'm like, I'm gonna Google some shit before you send me some shit. <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm already, I'm already, by the time that we're meeting again, I'm like, I just found out there's 17 birds that do this, 36 birds that do this, there was human intervention for these birds, and there's only one bird that dies. Right? So I'm having fun. Yeah. Right? That, that's the good collaboration. Yeah. Right? That is not, oh wait, but you're talking about the wrong birds and I don't want to fuck with you. So does it all boil down to just plain curiosity? Um, curiosity is a big part of it, but so is creativity, right? Y y you have to put those things together. Curiosity is important because you have to want to explore ideas, but then you need to know what to do with those ideas. You know, there's the famous Picasso quote, isn't there, that creativity is knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. And that's also where the playfulness comes in. So I had this string all over my house, this red string, that I would test the strength of that string. I would put pliers, silverware, sometimes notebooks, just to test it. And then that string ended up being in one of my first shows, because it just taught me like the level of how I can test and we know you like red. The, it, actually, I started falling. See, this is what goes back into the gang shit. No, I actually didn't like red because red meant I, that I was going to get in trouble, like fight if I wore it. So I, as an adult is when I'm like, oh, I can wear red, man. Come on, stop. So back to the red string. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's all good. We could go there. I like shit like that. Tangents <laughs> are beautiful. Um, so with me, it was like with this string and testing this pressure and testing all these things and how is that going to carry? Oh, wait, nah, okay, now I'm going to add that into something because I'm going to now talk to people about how this red string was actually me testing my limits. And then I'm going to add you, because I'm a poet, I'm going to be like, I did that at the age of nine. So at seven, my first memory was this. At eight, it was this. At nine, it was that string. So what are your memories and what is your list poem that never ends until you die? Because every year you should add a new line. You should create every year. Every year you should do something for yourself that has no capital or nothing crazy attached. Just to let your imagination go bonkers. Right? So like what is your list poem? And what is your challenge to yourself that has shit to do with none of this capital, none of this crazy, none of this. Just like for you. How are you keeping your shit alive? Because the one thing I want to say about like Doing all these things, what I realized, this is the only room that didn't bring up the word trauma like that heavy. 
But everywhere else, I've been having to tell everybody, like, yo, 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 stop. That's not here. That doesn't live here. Grandma never passed that down and didn't want me to have that. We had those discussions. So I know what I'm doing and building for people that doesn't have newspaper person. You can't say trauma to that because that's not what it was. You're projecting your issues into this store. Did you have somebody that had issues with dementia? And then I crack them and then they start crying. And then we have an hour conversation and they go write a beautiful paper or a beautiful uh, newspaper article, like blah, blah, blah. Today was all day of that where I got to remind people that it does not have to be traumatizing, right? From, from the nice, beautiful struggle of taking care of yours, it goes into healing and celebrating. So use old stuff that they left behind to celebrate, not to remind you of the gone. There's tools in all of that, and that's really the tap in, right? That is like, as artists, we're able to tap in and be like, there's something here that I don't know what it is, but let me take some time, let me think about it, and like, hmm. Oh, she left all these things, and there's something here. Oh, look at these letters that actually supported all these people, and blah, 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 and then a story comes. How long did it take you what was the, the journey of realizing that you wanted to create something? For her or for me? No, I mean, I think wanting to create something for the community. After, after I realized that, um, again, goes back to the pandemic, when I saw that man nigga send out those fake templates that they care about everybody in their emails, um, those, uh, I stand with Black Lives Matter and all this shit. And like, right after the pandemic happened, everybody was like bullshitting themselves. All institutions were. Million dollar ones and broke ones. And a lot of the, I, they were playing games with people's lives. And I was like, I'm not an artist for that. So now I'm just gonna reallocate your funding. Every time you ask me to dance, I'm gonna tell you, you need to add double that, cause I need to do some work if you wanna have my skin. Cause really that's at the end of the day, that's what it is. My skin is in Max Machina because of this, right? So Max Machina is failing forward with me and giving me the proper tools for us to collaborate and be able to fail forward creating tools for people. So it's like, that's the only companies I collaborate with. I'm gonna have Vallejo call me up and be like, yo, shit crazy, let's walk, let's, let's go over here, let's eat this, let's talk about this, and I'm like, I fuck with that energy. You ain't even send me an email, nigga. You're like, yo, I'm gonna send you a dude, y'all gonna talk, go. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like it's it's the I beauty like of that. You're trying to jump in here, oh, sorry, Dr. Like, I, Nikki. I just don't, I'm a, no, no, I it's just. Uh, I know, I know, I know. I know. From the beginning, I said, "Why am I in the middle? I can't see them both." Ah, ah. That was my first ten minutes up here, just like coño. Yeah. <laughs> you look like there was something you wanted to say when he was just describing. Obviously, the pandemic for so many people for so many reasons, and many of us probably don't even haven't truly internalized you know the experience and the aftermath right um but it's you've mentioned it several times it's something that's really uh, impacted your practice and your life and as he was describing that in terms of choices that he would make now mm -hmm. um relative to his creative practice and the people he wants to work with i mean you were shaking your head and i was just wondering what part well, of I it that you were really I resonating i was just thinking that as he as Flacco, you were explaining your work. I was thinking, what a beautiful example of mental time travel in action it was, because you're, you know, you're describing how you were feeling before the pandemic and what you had done in the past, right back to the red strings when you were nine, and then at the same time, almost in the same breath, moving forward to what you want to do with it next based on where you are in the moment and just thinking that you know the way in which we discuss these things brings it so much more to life you know in a standard psychology class you would hear the definition of mental time travel subjectively traveling back to the past and into the future you might get a standard case study probably the most famous one is henry meliason um h who was known as hm during his life. But it's, it's when you describe this rich tapestry of the mental and physical processes that make up this thing, these body memories, these mind memories, these ways in which things can suddenly change and, 
and suddenly the door can open. You know, you've got a glimpse of conscious awareness that maybe only meant it for a glimpse. It really brings the whole thing in into perspective. And also showing that with these really rich themes such as this, you can take it so much further. I mean, I think for what you and I are doing together, and what you want to do, I feel like the door is only just open. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's a whole future ahead of us of things that, you know, we'd like to do together. Some of them are just not verbalised yet. You know, it's just a feeling, just an intuition, if you like. See, that's the type of artwork. I can't wait, bro. It's just, it's just drippy. It's exciting <laughs> as hell, bro. Like, come on, I'm gonna think about mad, weird ass science questions and I could just be like, not feeling any type of way, but just be like, yo, Nikki, I'm gonna email you, get ready. Get ready, cause they're gonna be crazy. <laughs> and it's that, find, to find collaborators like that, it's hard. Especially when, when people just wanna be able to say, oh, I'm working with you. So it, it's, it's beautiful when you're able to, somebody's able to connect you to somebody to just be open to fail. And also so much better meeting in person. Oh, fuck, yeah. Fuck Zoom you know, world. And, and, until today, it was all done on Zoom. Well, you know, I'm grateful to Zoom because it allowed us to have contact in times when we couldn't have had contact. And I'm also I'm fed up with Zoom. You know, I, it's not... Yeah, I, that, that's that European cursing. Y'all yeah, peeped that, right? <laughs> there was such a humbleness to it, too. Just, ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Qué lindo. But you know, the, the conversations you can have in person are just so much better. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'd all agree, hence the reason why we're physically sitting here amongst one another. Yeah. Um, last question, um, and I know you're going to stick around for a little while so that if folks have questions or thoughts, feedback, um, I'm sure both of you would love that. Um, but if a genie jumped out of a bottle, and you could have one wish, what would it be? I'd like to know how to talk COVID. I'd like to be able to really get inside the head of a jay or a raven. Saw a pair of blue jays today in Central Park. Very excited. But I'd, I'd really, you know, or if there was some really clever way of figuring out whether you, it would be possible to think beyond words rather than just with and without them. So you asked, you said I could only have one. I've been, been a little bit cheeky. I've given you two. <laughs> Fucking bars, bro. <laughs> I like that. Can you think without words? Um. What do you guys think about that one? I don't think I would have ever asked myself that. It's, hmm. What do you think? What do you got? I want to be plants. I want to be all the plants in the world. I told, like, I'm always photographing the plants. I love the fucking one that looks like a bird. I don't remember the name right now. Smoke the blunt before this fucking sit down. <laughs> um, but um, we keep it real here. Have you? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah. I know. For, <laughs> it, real. There's no. We're I'm friends. not. Ain't nobody editing for nobody, bro. Come on now. We gotta be real. Well, what do you not want? Like, the genie's right there. Bird, like not birds. Um, flowers, bro. I want to be all type of flowers and like all type of grass and all type of everything. Like I just want to be able to be trees. Just stay, stay in the motherfucking field. I want to be able to see all of that, and like be all of that, and like what does the wind do to it? And why does it chase the sun? And I know why, but like to be able to like choose to be bent for your whole, you know, and like all that shit, I want to be able to like just be that and experience that. Bird songs, baby. Let some birds lawn at me and shit and be like, what up, little nigga? You good? All right. I think we're going to wrap it out right there. <laughs> I want to thank you, Dr. Nikki, and I want to thank you, Flacco. Many good thoughts were shared today. Thank you both. Turn these off. Bird song, let's go. Bird song. That's that shit, bro. Bird song. You know I'm birding, baby. Bird song. Where my binoculars at? Bird song. 
I'm with the trees. Bird song. I'm looking for birds, y'all. Bird song.